Welcome everybody. We are here for the weatherization update national perspective session. And to tell you a little bit about this session, it's been an unprecedented year for the weatherization assistance program with the coronavirus pandemic, putting production on hold or on pause nationwide. NASCAP will provide an overview of the impact of COVID-19 on the national program, summarize recent policy and legislative developments and share innovative practices from states. An update will be provided on current NASCAP projects, including our workforce development, working group, and annual funding survey. Today, we have two speakers from NASCAP. The first speaker will be Amy Klusmeyer. She's the Weatherization Assistance Program Director at NASCAP. And she supports the state weatherization program managers through training and technical assistance, research and government affairs, Amy started working in weatherization in 2004 as an installer in South Central Wisconsin. She later served as the lead program and policy analyst for the state of Wisconsin's weatherization assistance program and as a project manager for Slipstream, an IREC accredited training center. She holds a master's degree in public affairs and urban regional planning. Our second speaker is Andrea Schroer. She is a weatherization program manager at NASCAP. And Andrea brings 11 years of state energy office experience to her role as the weatherization program manager with NASCAP. As a senior program manager for the Georgia Environmental Finance Authority, she managed 26 million in state energy programs, delivering renewable energy and energy efficient projects. The last five years, Andrea has managed Georgia's weatherization assistance program. Prior to joining the organization, Andrea worked for Quest Communications, as a director, program manager, nat network engineering, and responsible for the nationwide build of cyber centers. Andrea in earned her bachelor's in communication system management from Ohio University and a master's in environmental policy and management from American Military University. She's a certified project manager professional and dedicated to empowering states to deliver successful weatherization programs that conserve energy and improve lives. And a couple of things before we get started with the speaker, I wanna let you know that we will be taking questions and answers at the end. So please put your questions in the chat and we will make sure to try to get to all of them at the end of the session. And also at the end, there will be a link for you, for those of you that need BPI credits. So you'll wanna click on that link that shows up in the stream towards the end. And now I'll go ahead and turn this over to Amy. All right, thank you so much, Carrie. Um, and thank you to Energy Out West for putting on a great conference. I'm gonna take a moment here to share my screen with you all. And, um, you know, we've had the opportunity to listen in on some of the sessions the last day and a half, and they've just been great. Um, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to join you today. So we're gonna get started here. Um, we are going to provide um, some brief updates on projects we've been working on over the past year uh, that, and we'll focus a lot of that conversation on COVID-19 and the impact it's had on weatherization. We're also gonna look ahead and talk about um, upcoming potential legislation and share some uh, information from a workforce development project that is ongoing at NASCAS. Uh, so that is a brief outline for today's session. And we are going to ask you, as Carrie mentioned, to type questions in the chat as we go, but we're also going to engage you in an online polling tool. So right now, if you want to open a new browser, and it can be any browser you choose on your laptop or other device, if you type in poll everywhere, poll e -E, sorry, pollev.com in that uh, browser address, um, you should get a login screen and you enter the username NASCASPSTAFF125. So that's N-A-S-C-S-P staff 125. And that link should be added to the chat so you'll have it and uh, we'll remind you of this as we go through the session. So NASCASP is the member association for the state uh, CSBG or Community Services Block Grant Program and Weatherization Program grantees. We are funded in part by a grant from the Department of Energy to provide training and technical assistance to state offices. And also we provide some communication support and research. We also do legislative work on behalf of state offices and we'll talk more about all of this in detail throughout the session, but there's a link to our webpage here if you wanna go and uh, learn more about what we do. Um, as Carrie mentioned, Andrea and I are presenting today. We also wanted to highlight we have some new staff at NASCASP, um, so you'll be seeing new faces throughout the next year. 
And we are um, uh, saying goodbye, sadly, to Eric Baina, um, who is going back to graduate school this year. I know many of you have met Eric over the past four plus years, and um, he is, we're very excited for him, but uh, sad to see him go. So, um, but look forward to working with Kyrie, Ian, and Paige over the next couple of years. We are a member association governed by our board of directors. And for the purpose of our board, we're split into five regions throughout the country. So we have all of the region reps and alternates here on the screen and all of their contact information is available on our website. I'm guessing most of you are in um, regions three, four, and five. So you can see here on the screen who your regional rep is. And um, if you have any questions about what NASCASC is working on or suggestions for things we should be working on, please reach out, reach out to your regional reps. I also wanna say um, we are so fortunate to have Bruce Hagen as our WAP chair. He has just been a, a huge supporter of ours. Um, we reach out to him often for advice and technical expertise. So thank you, Bruce, for your service to NASCASP and the weatherization program. Also wanna highlight some of our national partners. We work with a lot of partners in primarily in the DC area. Um, you know, I always show this slide and say, we're so fortunate to work with, with all of these folks, but right now um, after the COVID experience, I can sincerely say that I have such an appreciation for the work that they do and, and, and an appreciation for how important it is for us to be collaborating to ensure that we're providing support that you all need to continue operating the program at the state and local level. I wanna highlight our partnership with Energy Out West. This is a photo from a uh, an event on Capitol Hill that we did in July of 2019. And I'm sure you recognize a lot of the faces in that photo. Um, it was a great event um, that provided some education to the, some staffers on the Capitol Hill. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that event in a moment. So again, here's what you should see when you log into that Poll Everywhere website, it's pollev.com. And we're gonna ask you to engage in this conversation on the next slide. And again, the NASCAST staff 125. So we shared a little bit about who we are. We'd like to learn more about who's on the line today. So you should, if you're logged into Poll Everywhere, be seeing that map. And let me make sure that, that is activated here. And you should be able to um, click on that map and tell us where you're calling in from today. And I'm gonna click on Madison, Wisconsin, which is where my, what has become my home office is. Um, and Andrew is calling in from Georgia today. We have staff in DC. So it looks like we have a great uh, representation from all across the country. So that's really Cool to see and we'll uh, keep that in mind as we move through the sessions here. So wow, every yeah, it looks like every somebody in every region is uh, on the phone today. That's great. So one more question for you, which should pop up on the screen. Where do you work? We'd like to learn more about um, who the audience is today. Looks like a lot of local agency contractors, some state government employees and some a uh, little bit mix of everyone. So state association staff, weatherization training centers and other staff, but primarily local agencies, CAAs and contractors. All right, thank you everyone for participating in those polls. That's very helpful to know as we move along in the presentation and keep that browser open. We'll, we'll keep going back to it throughout the, the presentation. So I'm gonna give uh, a few quick updates and then turn it over to Andrea so she can dive into some detail on COVID-19. Um, before I share the programmatic updates, I just I do wanna highlight a couple of events that, that we um, hosted this year and um, started us off on a positive note on those, those days when we used to be able to get in a room together and, and see each other. So this again was that event in July of 2019 um, on Capitol Hill that was sponsored by Representative Marcy Kaptur. I'll talk about her later as uh, one of our, our key supporters in Congress. She is the chair of the uh, Energy and Water Subcommittee for the appropriations in the House. Also attending the event was Paul Tonko. He's in the lower left-hand corner uh, in that photo, and he's the um, representative from New York who's sponsoring the reauthorization re bill in the House. So some very important um, uh, champions of weatherization came to the, this event along with a lot of staff. Um, so it was a great opportunity to educate um, a lot of people on Capitol Hill in advance of weatherization day and the budget process. 
I also want to take an opportunity to highlight our winter conference. Every year we host a conference in the DC area in the winter and we do an awards ceremony. And this year we honored Mimi Burbage with our Jean, Dean Diggs WAP Champion Award. This award is presented to individuals who are true champions of the cause of weatherization. And it was a very special day, as you can see in the photo here, many Energy Out West um, people were able to attend as well as Jean Diggs herself who presented the award to Mimi. So it was one of the highlights of the year for us and um, just wanted to take this opportunity to again say congratulations Mimi. Thank you for everything you do for weatherization. So jumping into the programmatic updates, um, we wanted to start with the ACSI survey, which is the American Customer Satisfaction Index survey. If you listened in on DOE's session this morning, they talked in um, pretty good detail about how they are responding to the survey results. Grantees at the state level are doing the same thing. Um, they are also developing plans and, and taking action to improve their programs. The great thing about the 2019 survey was we saw um, most states increased their scores compared to 2017 or stayed the same. We saw significant score increases in some states. So this was a really great um, thing to see early on in the year. And um, uh, we really appreciate DOE's commitment to continuous improvement. Um, this has really given a voice to the local agencies and allowed them to participate in this process and also has given a great tool to the states for improving our programs. NASCAS continues to um, host and manage WAPTAC. This is a public website with a lot of resources that you all can access after this presentation. I'm sure many of you have visited this site in the past. We wanted to highlight a few new resources. We've been reorganizing the site and adding new things. So we have some new RFP samples up if you're looking for um, some, some sample language for a contractor RFP, those are available on the website. We have all of the state field guides and program and policy manuals on the website. So if you wanna browse those from other states, they are there, as well as some new health and safety client education tools. We are also posting some um, new webinars on this website. The most recent one we did was on AC programs and weatherization, and um, that was done in response to um, the LIHEAP stimulus funding that was recently released in May. A lot of states um, were looking to develop new programs or improve or enhance the programs that they currently had. So that webinar looks in detail at three state programs and um, the program design that they use. Each year, NASCAS partners with the Community Action Partnership to release a funding report. And this report um, details the amount of money available to the weatherization network each year. In 2018, this report showed that just over a billion dollars was available total to the weatherization network. And this includes three primary funding sources. The first is LIHEAP, and that is the largest um, piece of this funding pie at 41%. The other piece of the pie is um, typically non-leveraged or non-federal leveraged funds. So this primarily includes utility funding and um, state funding, but also the Community Action Partnership gathers information from states and, and state association or state associations and local agencies on um, charitable donations and um, foundation grants and other sources of funding. All of that information gets put together to come up with that $1.1 billion number. We also learn from this report that for every DOE dollar that's invested in weatherization, that allows a dollar and 52 cents of non-federal funds to be leveraged for the purpose of, of weatherizing homes. So it's really a great return on that DOE investment. And even though DOE is the smallest piece of the pie, we all know that DOE is critical for the quality of work in the weatherization program and the standards and policies that we follow. And as I mentioned, without DOE and that ability to leverage that funding, most states would not have any LIHEAP or other funds for weatherization. So, I wanted to share one more graph from um, the 2018 report. This is just showing our 10-year trend of total funding in the weatherization program. And this is um, funding reported by the state grantee offices. So that purple bar at the top is those other leveraged funds. The red bar is LIHEAP and the blue bar at the, towards the bottom is, is DOE. If you focus in on that DOE funding, you can see the big bump in 2009 for ARA and the Recovery Act. And then we came back down and, and ever since 2014, we've been on this you know, nice slight increase um, 
and, and that has increased through 2020, um, where we saw a DOE allocation over $300 million for the first time since, since ARA. So that was a big milestone for us, and, and it's a trend that we want to see continue. Um, so, you know, coming into this final year of the grant cycle, we were in a really good position, as, as Erica kind of showed this morning, of spending out that grant money and, um, and you know, finishing strong um, for, for in most states and, and for the program as a whole. And then um, coronavirus happened and March um, 2020 really kind of changed everything. Um, so this is what we're going to focus uh, most of the rest of the conversation on. And Andrea is going to talk in more detail about how uh, COVID has impacted our program. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> yeah, it, it, Amy uh, summed that up pretty nicely in that 2020 uh, handed us a, a surprise with the coronavirus, and it has certainly impacted the whole WAP network nationwide and, and really the clients that we serve, right? They're all, so many of them are elderly, disabled, uh, many with serious health conditions, and these are the, mo the most vulnerable clients um, to this pandemic. So as you can see uh, from the graph on the right, and they're the total COVID cases that were reported by the CDC. And you can kind of follow it along. It, it rises steeply in March, and then it's followed by a pretty steady decline during when all the stay at home orders were in effect, which was most of April and May. And then as states and cities began to reopen in June, we see the curve moving sharply right back upward through the end of August. So we know there, there have been several hot spots across the country. This, um, the map on the left is from CDC from uh, a week ago in August. And, and it seems like some of the hot spots have shifted. So, you know, New York got hit really hard in the beginning. And now we're seeing Florida, Texas, California, Georgia uh, being hit especially hard in these summer months. And I really think it's safe to say we can expect the unexpected and that local situations can change very quickly with COVID cases spiking. Um, so with that to consider, we would like to do another poll, please, with our audience on our next slide. Um, and we're curious to know, especially with so many local agencies here on the call, what has been your biggest challenge related to COVID-19? So if you go into the pollev.com and uh, if you already have your browser open and if you enter NASCASP staff, there's a lot of S's in there, so be careful. Uh, NASCASP staff one, two, five. All right. So people are answering, there's fears probably from both the workers and the clients. Uh, there's just an inability to get back into homes, childcare, Working from the home has its challenges. PPE availability, yep, we've sure heard that. Getting HVAC equipment delivered, yeah, we heard that on the COVID session that folks were having trouble getting HVAC equipment. There were delays, that and fridges, I think. Keeping up with the changes because we are definitely in a time of change and trying to keep your staff busy. Okay and not working. Yeah, that's stressful. So yeah, this is very helpful. And um, yeah, it was difficult. Many people were in a place of, do we compete with PPE when we know our frontline workers need to have the PPE to care for, for those that were, were sick from COVID? Staying in good communication with staff and contractors, uh, being able to adapt and change practices. Yep. So it looks like our top three are fears, inability to get back into homes, and PPE availability. That's really helpful. Thank you for that. Appreciate your participation. It's um helpful for us to know too what's happening on the ground. So what we have seen, we've been tracking the impact of COVID on production since March. We've been reaching out to states to find out if their production is paused, if it's operational, if the state did a complete stop work order. Um, 
So most states and local agencies were paused from probably late March through June. And the average pause in production was about 75 days. And we started seeing most states and local agencies really getting back out into the field in June and July. Um, but before they could get back out, states often required local agencies to meet additional health and safety guidelines you know, prior to letting folks just go back into the home. So um, per grantee reporting, this is as of last week, 82% are reporting that most of their crews are back out in the field or they're fully operational. We have about 9% that are still suspended and 9% are operating under very limited basis or they've actually opened back up and then they've had to reverse their opening status because of COVID spiking or because of COVID cases in their offices. I've spoken with California and Texas about these situations specifically um, where they opened back up and COVID uh, hit their office and they had to close uh, the offices back. So in the next slide, I have uh, an example as states were beginning to prepare to resume field work. So fear was top, right, among, you know, what are your concerns with COVID? So some states went out and they proactively reached out to their client base really to try to gauge their response to having weatherization workers in the home. This was actually done by Missouri. Um, they polled one month of their wait list. They had all their subgrantees go back and check. And so they called 137 clients, talked to them about some of the additional PPE and some of their processes and sanitizing and disinfecting and said, are you comfortable? with crews and workers and auditors and QCI coming back into the house. And um, I was a little surprised it was this high, but 121 of those 137 said, yes, come back. We want weatherization service, please. And 16 said, no, not at this time. We're just not comfortable. Please defer us for a short period of time or put us on the wait list and come back to us. And when we had our regional calls in July, we heard several states really echo this same reaction from clients where most clients are really eager and ready to have weatherization work done on their homes. So in the next slide, I think we're, we're all aware that going back into these homes, resuming field operations would not or should not look or feel the same prior to COVID. Um, so DOE stepped up release guidance uh, pretty early on in, in WAP memos 060 and 062. They responded to questions from grantees and local agencies alike, and they included many recommendations uh, for taking virtual applications, using e-signatures, adopting and adapting new monitoring protocols, and recommending that all grantees update their health and safety plans to allow for infectious disease preparedness and response. And this included implementing engineering and admin controls where feasible. So if you see that graph on the right, that is the hierarchy of controls from the CDC. And the idea is the top is probably the safest and then it kind of narrows down at the bottom. So um, it starts out with elimination and maybe an example of elimination is um, a grantee updated their health and safety plan to include the potential for deferral if a client in the pre-screening questions answered that somebody in the house had COVID-19, right? That's an effective form of elimination. And then there were also some uh, changes added on the engineering uh, control methods. So if folks could put a client in a room and put plastic up and try to keep that client contained, or they could ask the folks to leave the house altogether. Um, so while it says it's the, the least effective method is PPE, um, it's still an important control method. And um, I think it was second on your list of concerns in that first poll that y'all answered. In this next slide, this is um, a great example of a state using adaptive management technology and saying, I'm going to take a look at all of these recommendations and I'm going to adapt my policies and procedures. So um, I don't know if Brenda's on this call or not, but thank you again for doing such a great job and sharing so many of your documents. Wyoming was a bit of an anomaly in that it was operating pretty much the whole time during COVID. They didn't have that pause in production like most of the states did. So um, they, 
you know, they took that hierarchy of controls and created this checklist and other documents that several states were able to uh, use as examples and create their own plans from. But it does a really good job of addressing many of those areas of elimination, engineering, admin, and PPE. You could see on this checklist that uh, the first thing they're asking is those COVID screening questions. And if they answer yes to some of those questions, they, that client could be deferred. For 30 days. You know, they're asking here, and the third one is the unit suitable for splitting interior and exterior work. Again, a great example of an engineering control uh, adapted. And then social distancing, right? That's important. So um, it's uh, it, one of the best things about this network, I think, is their ability to share and uh, help other states with best practices. So it was important that agencies work to update their client screening questions. And, and this was really important for the worker safety because before going out to a home that might have a COVID positive client, um, they were hopefully able to catch um, most of these before they sent all their crews out. And this was also something that we heard uh, on the regional calls is that these client screen, these updated client screening questions were pretty, pretty effective. But then it was also important to give the clients a choice to defer service. You know, even though the majority of the clients in the Missouri pool we just showed said, yes, there were still 16 of those 137 that said, you know, we're, we are fearful. We're not ready to have somebody come into our home. So in the next slide, uh, this is another example of a state that added a new risk assessment form to their intake process. So they would go through and ask a series of questions and try to determine a level of risk to each client. And, and if the client was identified as a medium or high risk, then they were moved to the wait list or deferred list for a short period of time. And what they were doing is servicing the lower uh, risk clients. So again, it's an example uh, of a new administrative protocol and uh, at work to mitigate the risk of COVID to both the clients and the workers, which is important. In the next slide, this is just another example of um, updated screening and education materials. So this state um, updated their client screening and if anyone answered yes to any of these six questions. If you had COVID, if you tested positive, if somebody in the house tested positive, if you traveled pretty much to anywhere in the US right now, um, you were put on a 30 day deferral um, period or wait list. So we're seeing most states have a deferral period that ranged anywhere from 30 to 90 days. And uh, I just think it's important that so many states did report that they're catching most of these deferrals prior to having crews drive all the way out to a site to find out that somebody's sick in the home. So, which is important. Um, and on the next slide, we did hear from some states that clients were being difficult about wearing masks and that they weren't respecting the social distancing protocols when workers were in the home. So, um, this is an example that a state did. They updated their attestation form, excuse me, to protect their crews from clients. Some states revised their client consent forms. Um, they would get up front in agreement that said the client's going to wear a mask. They're going to limit the amount of people that are in the home to just the homeowner and that they would sign a COVID hold harmless agreement, basically a liability waiver. So while on site, if this agreement was being violated, workers had the right to leave the job and defer the home for a period of time. But I think this was a really good idea by making this clear up front. It was a smart move to communicate these are new expectations and new rules with the clients. And uh, in the next slide, we have some results from a NASCASP survey um, that we did back in June, we asked our grantees if they were experiencing shortages of PPE. And as you can see, over half said yes, about uh, 11 said no, and five said they just, they just weren't sure. And even though this is the last step in the hierarchy of controls, it's still a very important control method. And most states wouldn't allow local agencies to send workers back into the field without proper PPE and training. So for those of you that tuned into the COVID-19 panel discussion yesterday, which was great, 
Um, you might have seen uh, many states mention in the chat box that they required uh, all their workers to take the back to work safety training that the Energy Smart Academy created and which is now free, thanks to DOE to all WAP workers. So um, you can see up here on the, on the poll, overwhelmingly it was the N95 masks where people were reporting the greatest shortage followed by the Tyvek suits, the gloves, and then the disinfecting wipes. And then they also reported it was kind of an ebb and flow to the availability. Something would be really hard to get one week and then the next week they could get it, but then they couldn't get gloves. So uh, I'm guessing that's probably still the case. But uh, in the next slide, we'd like to do another uh, poll about costs. And if you could go into the poll EV again, please. Uh, curious to know what you think is a reasonable amount to charge to each WAP job to cover the cost of additional health and safety. That's the, that's the time to disinfect, um, you know, the car, the tools, the uh, home that you're in when you're leaving, you know, disinfecting the things that you touched, um, the extra PPE, all of that. Just curious to know what you, how you're handling uh, those additional health and safety costs and what you think is an, a reasonable amount to charge. So answers are coming in. We've got 50, 100, 275, Five, let me make sure I got that right. Yep, 500. Uh, materials and labor, 300. 200 a day for single family projects. Mm -hmm. $40. 2,000. I'm guessing maybe there was an extra zero in that response, but 100 based on four person crew. That's helpful. Yep. 300. So we're seeing kind of a lot in that range between a, a hundred and 300, 250 to 500. I guess it would also depend too on how many crew members were probably inside the house and how long um, folks were in there. Yep. 250, 100. It really depends on the size of the crew. Yeah, I can imagine. So 175 per person per day. Yep. Looks like other people are reporting per day, you know, uh, one to 150 per day on site. Thirty five hundred. At least thirty five per person per day. Two fifty. Yeah, depend it, and that's true point. It, it really depends on what type of PPE is required and the number of crew. Yeah. Now this is very helpful. 40 per person per day. Okay, good. So it, it looks like most people have kind of already started figuring this out. Um, and it'll, it'll also be interesting to hear how uh, states decided to handle that additional cost. I, we've heard from many that they've updated their health and safety plans to either allow for an additional percentage. I know the standard is 15% or less, but you can ask for more. Uh, you just have to have the data to back that up. And I think we've been hearing something around an additional 3%. So maybe making the health and safety 18%. Um, and then kind of what, what we're seeing reflected here somewhere uh, between 100 and $500, depending on you know the amount of crew members in the home if they're going to more than one home. So great. Thank you. Really appreciate your input into this. Yeah, this is uh, good data. Thank you everybody. And thanks for participating in the, in the polls today.
So, um, so back to PPE again, uh, I just wanted to highlight some innovations on the PPE front. This is a great example from Washington State. They got the CAP Association uh, to have some meetings with the local agencies to find out what do you need um, in, in, the, in the way of PPE for the near term. And um, they ended up doing a bulk purchase of PPE for all the agencies. And then they gave them a couple options. They used CARES funding to help purchase this equipment. And they said, we can bill you at cost, meaning you can pay for all your PPE. They also offered to cost share with the agency. So like a 50-50 split, or they could pay in full for the agencies, which was very generous. So I just thought that was a, a neat example of a, uh, community action, action partnerships stepping up to really help their local agencies and make sure that the workers were safe and had the PPE they needed. We also saw some states adding a PPE source directory on their state website while others hosted TNTA calls that included open discussions um, where agencies might be able to share vendors if they found somebody that actually had PPE. So um, it's, it's been a, a it's been a struggle and a challenge for many. We know and we could certainly appreciate that. And um, there's been some different approaches too to addressing the measure costs. We saw how how um, there were consistencies, but also variations in the cost of PPE and the quantity. And um, you know that if states can offer flexibility to their local agencies and their contractors. Uh, we've heard from some that normally while the contractors have that PPE built into the cost, they're actually adding a separate line item for them to just do a flat fee and charge per job. Uh, so again, flexibility in uh, the time of COVID goes a long way. <laughs> All right. In the next slide, I just wanted to highlight another innovation. I think one of the most consistent things we've heard um, from states and from local agencies is that the COVID pandemic inspired many to begin implementing virtual applications. Uh, I was talking with folks in Texas back in June and they mentioned that almost all of their local agencies developed online apps and some even created YouTube application videos that walk clients through the new online process. We heard from several states that they're using their existing WAP software systems better. So, um, some have reported that they actually had DocuSign and e-signature capability in their software systems, but they just weren't using them. They were just still using their paper copies. And so I think uh, they are now using the capabilities in their existing systems and utilizing those virtual applications better. So um, we've also heard some states have used this downtime to optimize multiple client signature and attestation forms. Sometimes it can feel like there's 15, 16 pages for these folks to sign. And they've taken this downtime and tried to merge and blend those forms into uh, maybe one, two, or three forms that the clients could sign. So folks have been busy innovating and adapting during this pause in production, uh, which I think is, is great to see. And in uh, the next slide, I just wanted to remind you all of some COVID-19 resources. Um, we at NASCAS continue to update our COVID resource page and our member portal with state-specific examples and forms. Things come in weekly, so uh, don't forget to just touch base once in a while and make sure you've you know checked in to see if there's anything new. In the e-news, we usually try to highlight what changes have been made, but um, check back in there. And also CAPLA did a great job of providing guidance in several areas to local agencies for reopening their doors. Uh, BPA is a back to work resource guide. And of course the free online energy smart back to work safety training. So these are all really good resources to take advantage of and to look at. And I think with that, I'm passing it back to Amy to talk about looking ahead. All right, thank you, Andrea. I'm sure we got some questions in during that, but I think we're going to save them all to the end and just keep going here. So I'm going to provide a brief legislative update and then we'll turn it back to Andrea for an update on some of our workforce development projects that are in progress. And we'll close by talking about how we can celebrate our success and, and weatherization day. So I'm gonna talk about two types of legislation. There's authorization and appropriations. Authorization is that 
um, bill that establishes the congressional intent of programs. So this is our opportunity to make some big statutory changes to programs. Uh, reauthorization bills is what we're, we're going to talk about and specifically to weatherization and, and these can be a standalone bill or part of a larger package. Appropriations are, is just that annual process of funding government agencies. There are 12 bills total that Congress passes and weatherization is in the energy and water bill. If a bill is not passed, which we all anticipate is going to happen later this year, we will need a continuing resolution in order to maintain funding for programs. So here's just a quick look at the reauthorization history for weatherization. And the last reauthorization bill was in 2007 and that funded the program through 2012. Um, that of course covered the period of ARA here and, and in the graphic you can see the, the blue and green bars are production in weatherization during that time. Um, there have been several attempts since, since 2012 to pass another reauthorization bill but it hasn't happened. Um, so we're continuing to rely on either that annual appropriations process or a continuing resolution. So right now we have two current standalone bills in the House and the Senate. Um, both are very similar uh, reauthorization bills. Uh, they would authorize $350 million annually for weatherization, which is a, an increase over our current um, appropriation. Remember this year we're asking for $310 million uh, for weatherization. In addition to providing funding for the program, this bill makes a couple of uh, statutory changes. So these are changes that are in the federal statute. The DOE can't make on their own. We need an act of Congress to actually make these changes. So the first one is one um, that we know is very important to the local network and the, the WAP network as a whole, and that is increasing the administrative percentage from 10 to 15 percent. That is in this house in this proposal. Um, the reweatherization date is proposed to change to a 15-year rolling date from the um, job completion date. So that would be a big change that um, I know a lot of agencies and, and states have been asking for. The bill and the proposal also clarifies that training and technical assistance funds can be used to train contractors, and the bill actually encourages the use of contractors and private contractors in weatherization. We know that's happening um, based on prior surveys that we've done. We know that a majority of the states are um, using a contractor-based model for delivering weatherization. We are doing a survey right now of states to update that data, and we, we will have some better information this fall on exactly how many, how many contractors um, are being used in the program. We do um, also see in this bill the, the allowance for DOE to explore including non-energy benefits in the savings to investment ratio. So this is not a requirement, it just gives DOE the opportunity um, to start evaluating how this might work. We also see in the reauthorization bill, a competitive program for innovation grants. And this has been one of the most contentious pieces of this bill over the years. Um, the compromise that we reached in the current standalone bills is that current weatherization providers, both the grantee state offices and the local agencies would be eligible to apply for these innovation grants. And they would be allowable for things like addressing deferrals and healthy homes measures and renewable energy, et cetera. We also saw an amendment from Representative Rush in Illinois to encourage uh, the hiring of minorities and other underrepresented groups in weatherization. So we don't have any real updates or movement on either of these bills. They were both introduced in April of 2019. They had hearings and they've really been stalled ever since. We do anticipate um, that rather than passing a standalone bill, these would be picked up in a larger legislative package. So we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Um, with the current FY 2021 appropriations uh, package that, that the House recently introduced. So this package proposes 310 million in regular appropriations. And remember, this is just the annual process that uh, Congress does to provide money to the federal agencies. So 310 million is a, a good, nice increase over what we've been receiving. We're continuing that little uptick um, that we've been seeing over the past four years. The House proposal package also includes a $3 billion stimulus, stimulus specifically for weatherization. And this is in a, a special emergency infrastructure title in response to COVID. 
here we see not only this um, additional funding, but also the, a number of the um, reauthorization elements are brought into this, this proposal. So we see that admin increased 2.5%. It's not as much as we were hoping for, but it's, it's better than 10. Um, there is a $300 million, a $3 million, $300 million set aside for innovation activities. And this was a very promising shift in what we've seen from past drafts. So rather than a competitive grant program, um, the House is proposing that um, this money be provided through uh, a formula allocation like the traditional WAP allocation to all states. So every state would get an appropriation of this money and it would be available to do things like address deferrals. There's also some set asides for DOE um, to do some workforce development and um, encouraging DOE to participate in interagency collaborations with HUD and HHS. The one, um, and I should mention the, the re-weatherization date change is also in this infrastructure title package. Um, it's just not on the slide. So the ACPU increase is something that we've really prioritized at NASCASP over the last couple of months. We know that um, in response to COVID, there, there, we need some flexibility on that average cost per unit. That is a statutory issue. It's not something that DOE has the ability to just change on their own. So we've been working with Congress um, to educate them about that. And we were very um, um, hopeful to see this in the House proposal. We also in this proposal saw um, after the, the first package was put out an amendment from Representative Paul Tonko and um, this amendment proposes to add through $250 million to that $310 million appropriation. And that would bring our total appropriation to 560 million. And this money is specifically added to ensure that we have uh, sufficient capacity to, to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. So really we're seeing two different approaches here to a potential stimulus. Um, we do want to clarify that we don't anticipate the three billion dollars will be picked up in the Senate. We don't really anticipate there's going to be any movement in the Senate anytime soon. Um, they haven't introduced an appropriations package yet, so um, we are, as I mentioned, expecting a continuing resolution. However, it is very promising to see um, some movement on some of the reauthorization elements in this House proposal and. Clearly, the House is really championing the, the weatherization program and, and is, is making a strong case here for giving us some additional funding in the near future. So that is the quick legislative update, and I'm going to turn it back to Andrea for workforce development. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, so workforce development continues to be a key issue in all of the energy efficiency sectors. There were 2.38 million folks employed in energy efficiency in 2019, so there is some fierce competition for these workers. Um, as a result, we have been hearing at the state level that uh, there are serious challenges to workforce development in recruitment and retention. And so in response, uh, we have developed a working group to provide um, a forum for discussion on some of these issues and prioritizing. And I'll talk about that in just a second, but before I do, I just wanted to mention, and Derek did a great job of going over this earlier today, talking about the badges toolkit, which was developed by DOE and it's being used in several states. I think you saw Utah was using it currently for worker training. So just a kind of key takeaway, it's a set of 25 badges. And it was based on the installation portion of the job, uh, job task analysis. And each badge defines a task or a measure an installer could perform on a home. And not all badges are applicable regionally. So um, anyway, the adoption is totally voluntary at this time. And it could be a way to provide flexibility into your TNTA plans and provides flexibility to training centers. So DOE is in the process of getting feedback on the badges toolkit from some of the early adopters. And uh, we'll see what, uh, what comes out of that. So in the next slide, I wanted to talk to you about our workforce development working group. Uh, we did a call for participants in what we expect will be at least a year long commitment to provide a, a discussion forum and explore opportunities for recruitment and retention of WAP workers. And we had a really good response from our grantee network. We have a 10 member workforce development working group. 
and I just heard last week from Washington that they are sending a representative. And we now have all five regions represented. It's a great group of people. Everybody's been very engaged and involved. We've met several times over the last two months. And uh, the group was presented with uh, three state examples of current wage surveys or wage studies that are being done at the state level today. And so after discussion, talking about what's, what should we prioritize first, wage study, salary survey, trying to create uh, a more identifiable national WAP brand or career ladder or succession planning, the group came back and said, I think we probably need a national wage survey and then a study uh, first. So that's what we're prioritizing at the moment. But before we continue, um, I wanted to pull the audience again and uh, ask other than a wage survey, what, for, what workforce development issues can NASCAS prioritize? So we'll give everybody a minute to put in a response. Recruitment. Definitely. <clears throat> yep. Recruitment, training, a WAP union. Training people and not having them leave after they become trained due to better opportunities. Yeah, that's a stinker. Hold on. That's a good one, too. Credentialing. Continuous training. That's important because this is certainly not an unskilled workforce program. Yep. Re, uh, what else do we have? So it looks like recruitment is coming up at the top, followed by training, recruitment with training and WAP managers training. It's always helpful. There's a lot of turnover in that as well. Okay. Okay. recruitment and training. So there's definitely some helpful advice you've given us. We'll take this back when we meet with the workforce development working group. I know we're still trying to hammer out the details on the wage survey, but trying to find out what we should focus on next with regards to recruitment and training. Uh, certainly important stuff if we're going to continue to have a successful uh, program. So, okay, thanks again for your participation. Appreciate that. Okay, so currently the working group has decided on these six full-time WAP positions to collect wage and fringe data on. So I don't know if, if you can see, but sometimes the job titles for the same position vary depending on the state or the region. So we've included multiple job titles for the same job classification along with a brief general description. And the basic premise is to collect wage and fringe data. And then once that data is collected, be able to assemble that data and then do an analysis or a comparison to a living wage or a median income so that it's, it's really going to be a two-part process. But we agreed these six core jobs were pretty much exclusively funded with weatherization funds and were probably subject to the highest turnover. On the next slide, we also identified some optional WAP positions at the local agencies. Um, and what made these not on our full-time list was that uh, many of the workforce development members did not have these positions. Uh, I think it, sometimes it depended on whether or not you were funded um, with WAP more generously um, versus maybe not having the, the same level as funding as some of the larger funding states. But, um, you know, this, not everybody has their own electrician or HVAC installer. And then the WAP fiscal manager, while very important position, often works in other programs. So um, we're continuing to refine this and we're working on uh, the data collection method now that we figured out what we want to collect 
and we'll be reaching out to national partners to, to figure out the best way to move this project forward. We'll keep you in the loop, which brings me, we've got two more polls and we're hoping you can help us get a better picture of the mix of crews and contractors that are in the network and then which positions you're having the hardest time uh, filling. So the first uh, poll we have is, are you contract mostly contractor-based, mostly crew-based, or are you a good mix of both? Okay. So the answers are still coming in. Right now it's showing up. The majority are saying they are contractor based, followed by crew, or followed by a mix of both and then crew. So that is really helpful. We'll be coming back to this slide uh, later after we watch this again. That's, that's really helpful to know. Thank you for that. And then which of the following weatherization jobs are the most difficult to fill and retain? And if you could rank the job categories by moving the most uh, difficult to the very top and let the least difficult kind of fall to the bottom of the list, we'll give everybody a minute. And um, Andrea, it's Carrie. I just wanted to let everybody know we're getting ready to wrap up. So um, I know that you're getting close to the end of your presentation. We want to try to wrap up so we're done on time. Very good. We'll, we'll uh, end very quickly here. Um, so it looks like energy auditor and assessor, <clears throat> crew lead, QCI, final inspector QCI, followed by energy auditor and crew lead. That is really good to know. That is kind of what we were thinking it might show up. So that kind of follows along. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to move forward very quickly and hand the controls back to Amy. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. And thanks everyone for participating in those polls. That's, that's great information to have. And um, I just wanted to end with a, a few notes on celebrating our successes and weatherization day is coming up October 30th. I also wanted to mention that um, this Friday is the anniversary of the 1976 authorization authorization of the program. So we'll be doing some communications around that. Um, look at our website and social media for more information. We are hosting a kickoff webinar with CAF and NCAF on September 9th. You can register for that now. And we are updating the planning toolkits that we provide annually to local agencies and state states for organizing events. Now, this was a fantastic demonstration project that we were fortunate to attend last year that Ken Robinette and the South Central CAP put together in Idaho with their utility partners. You can see uh, uh, Mike Simpson, Representative Simpson from Idaho is, is there attending the event. And our events are gonna look a lot different from this probably this year. So we're gonna be providing some, um, some tips and tools for planning virtual events around weatherization day. We'd also ask that you share your success stories with us. We have a form on our website where you can do that. And we'd love to have some new stories to share uh, leading up to weatherization day, whether it's a innovative practice that your state or local agency is, is uh, implementing or, or a client story. And then two upcoming virtual events. Uh, the CAP conference is, is at the end of this month and our conference is at the end of September. Both registration um, options are open. So visit our websites for more information. We are looking to have a, a couple of sessions with DOE and, and a mix of live and recorded content. And our contact info is here. You're welcome to reach out to either Andrea or I anytime with questions. Right. Well, thank you both so much, Amy and Andrea, for, for sharing this information with us. We're not going to have time to take those questions, but the questions were saved. And so we're going to get those out to you guys. And maybe there's a way that you could post them on a frequently asked questions site for folks who are interested. So thank you so much for your time. For those of you who need BPI credits, please look to the link in your chat stream and log in and do that. Be sure to attend more of our live events. And also the library is available for you uh, for those non-live events. So thank you so much for participating. Have a wonderful day. Bye everybody.